Hi, I'm Jan Vitkowski for Coldspring Harbour Laboratory. Uh, this is the third day of the 84th Coldspring Harbour Laboratory Symposium on Quantitative Biology. And the topic this year is RNA uh, control and regulation. I'm delighted to have Karen Edelman with me from Harvard University Medical School, who's going to talk to us about her talk, which I think you could have simply named Integrator. It sounds like a wonderful title for a film. <laughs> so what, what is this integrator monster? So uh, it's a, a very large complex of many proteins, about 14 at least. Um, and it's, it's actually quite understudied. Uh, so it was first uh, discovered by Ramin Shikatar's lab as something that causes the termination at non-coding RNAs, like snRNAs, so these RNA components of the spliceosome. And it had been thought to be sort of specific for the snRNAs, um, but little by little, as people started to peek into the world of integrator, it was realized that integrator, in fact, does bind other loci. And what we've recently started to appreciate is that it binds at protein coding genes and does much what it does at these snRNAs except that at snRNAs, then integrator causes the um, cleavage of the RNA and termination mm -hmm. after just a few hundred nucleotides. Right. That's okay for an snRNA because it's just a few hundred mm -hmm. nucleotides long. So that's the correct three prime end. But when it does this, this at protein coding genes, that's obviously not the entirety of the protein coding gene. So when it does this, it makes a, a, a short transcript that's prematurely, prematurely terminated, and that's non-functional. And so that's rapidly degraded. And so what we have is a, a situation that we've, we've come up upon where by studying non-coding RNAs, we've learned something new about protein coding machinery. So why does it do this? I mean, why does integrator truncate these, what presumably going to, presumably going to be quite normal full-length message? So this is a fantastic question. And I think this is why we're just at the beginning of understanding what integrator does, is that the, um, canonical models for protein coding gene expression have largely focused on understanding how the polymerase gets brought to the DNA. And then the process of elongation has been presumed to some extent that you know, once the polymerase gets started, it goes to the end, mm -hmm. and then the cleavage and polydenylation right. machinery is what takes it off the DNA finally. And that this process of transcription between start and stop is, is more or less a, a non-regulated or default pathway. And so the question now is, if that's not true, why? Why would the cell evolve such a thing? So the answer, of course, is we don't know. Um, but you can speculate that when the polymerase initiates transcription and generates a short RNA, and then undergoes this step that my lab has studied for many years as promoter proximal pausing, mm. it stops in the promoter region associated with this little, let's say, 20 to 60 nucleotide RNA. And it sits there and it waits for a signal to be released into the gene. Now, there are many reasons you can think of that you wouldn't want that polymerase to stay there forever. One is because this is a leaky process and you may not want the polymerase to essentially, eventually escape and, and, and leaky sort of transcribe that gene at a low level. And the other is maybe you just want to get the polymerase off of that gene. If the replication fork is coming through, if you have some kind of stress, mm -hmm. or if you have something else where you really want to clear out that region. So having a regulated termination factor that kind of clears the genome of this promoter proximal polymerase, uh, you could envision many reasons why this would be helpful, but we envision it mostly as a way of regulating transcription at a level where at any moment you can change your mind. You can tell the polymerase instead of terminating to continue on into the gene, um, and so you could very rapidly upregulate the expression of these genes. But it must be quite carefully controlled because otherwise integrator could be chopping uh, absolutely. things from every, every transcribed gene. Absolutely. And so this is, I mean, I think these are some of the exciting questions for the future. In the SN snRNA example, integrator is selectively recruited to the snRNAs through interactions presumably with a SNAP-C protein, so the transcription factor that binds to the start site. Mm -hmm. So in that ma manner, there's one level of regulation, which is probably selective recruitment. So we're trying to understand what might selectively recruit integrator to specific protein mm -hmm. coding genes. At the other level in the snRNAs, there's a sequence in the RNA 
that's recognized by integrator, or it's called a three prime box. And this, much like the poly A site in the canonical cleavage mm -hmm. and polydentylation pathway, it's an AU rich sequence that when integrator recognizes it, seems to stimulate this cleavage activity. And so what we're looking for now are the transcription factors that bring integrator to certain protein coding genes, the sequences within coding genes that may serve the role of this three prime oh. box, and then any other levels of regulation that may be sort of figuring into this. Uh, we do know that under different conditions, integrator can be deployed to different sets of genes. So in some of the work um, uh, in the, the paper that I was discussing, we've looked at the metallothionine genes. This is in collaboration with Jeremy Willouz. And he sees that under, under normal conditions, when cells are happy, integrator's not at the metallothionine genes. But when you stimulate metallothionine, integrator suddenly goes to the metallothionine genes and helps to attenuate that response so that it doesn't get out of control. So in that situation, it's not meant to keep genes sort of off under basal conditions, but rather mm -hmm. it's meant to, to dampen the expression so that an activation process yeah. doesn't cascade too far. So sort of a fail-safe mechanism. Exactly. exactly. Does integrate work at, at all genes, or is it a particular subset of type of genes? So we see, it, we see it recruited somewhat selectively to a, a particular subset of maybe 15 to 20 percent of all active genes mm -hmm. in the different conditions and cell types that we've looked at. And that, that work that we've done um, in, in um, Drosophila cells and a limited number of mammalian cells, mouse cells, is consistent with what's been shown in human cells by um, the Shikatar um, and Ben Karan and Pagano lab. So it seems to be not at every gene, but it seems to ha somehow f have a subset mm -hmm. that it selects. And what we find interesting is that that subset can be different in different cell types we've looked at, and then again under different conditions. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that there's a, a very selective targeting so that you don't have this crazy endonuclease, you know, yeah. chopping up all the yes. wrong things, yeah, that's but that's actually, that's going, actually that's going to the places where Gene expression should be attenuated. Yes. I mean, it could it could be a monster. It could be a monster, but you know the the, the phenomenon, the concept, has been around for decades mm -hmm. in the termination processes that we know and love in bacteria. I was, going, I was just going to say, is there a similar? So there is a transcriptional control. Where, yeah. There are terminators and anti-terminators, and in, in those in particular, in the lambda bacteriophage, there's a terminator anti-terminator switch in the promoter proximal region of some of the, the master regulatory genes. And so we know that this process um, exists in other organisms. Um, in the budding yeast uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, mm -hmm. there's a complex called NNS. And there, too, there's an RNA recognition. There's a sort of selective recruitment. And there's a, a cleavage activity towards both non-coding RNAs and a subset of coding genes. Mm. And so the, the basic idea that cells use a directed termination uh, is actually out there. It's not, it's not something that we you know, sort of right. are the first to, right. to propose. But in the mammalian system, this idea that you have regulated promoter proximal termination has been floated, has been out there for many years. But to nail down the yeah. complex and the conditions where it happens, that's, I think, what's, what's exciting and, and new at this point. Does that require the development of techniques that were able to do those sorts of experiments? Absolutely. I think that in order to be able to ever separate premature transcription termination from all the subsequent processes of RNA degradation, you know, decay, and then I think you need to be looking directly at the nascent transcriptome, to look directly at the nucleotides that are inside the RNA polymerase at any point in time. And so my lab has developed some techniques, and we've also optimized and used techniques developed by others, uh, like John Liss's lab, to really investigate the nascent transcriptome at single nucleotide level mm -hmm. resolution. And that's really what uh, I think the, the data that convinced us we had a handle on what integrator was doing was the data where we could see at these integrator attenuated genes very high levels of polymerase mm -hmm. that had got, gotten onto the promoter, begun transcribing, and then sort of gotten to as far as you know, plus 50 into the gene, but didn't make it any farther. And only when we knocked down the integrator subunits could we see then elongation of the polymerase past that point. And that's what really told us that we weren't looking at 
an RNA stability effect. We mm -hmm. weren't looking at something that was post-transcriptional, but we're really looking at a transcriptional cleavage and termination event. And so those nascent RNA assays were really essential, I think, for being able to, to understand that. Well, what's not about how integrated does it? It's obviously got you know, <laughs> RNA's activity. Yep. Um, uh, did you say how many subunits it is? I, so I the, the integrator complex is at least 14 subunits. Um, I think the field is still trying to understand how these sort of separate into subcomplexes, um, but clearly there's a subcomplex that contains the uh, integrator 4, 9, and 11 subunits. And 9 and 11 are really interesting because they're paralogs of two subunits in the normal cleavage and polydenylation machinery. So integrator 9 and 11 are paralogs of CPSF 73 and 100. And just like CPSF 73 and 100, both proteins have a beta-lactamase domain um, and a beta-caspase domain. And this gives them the ability to cleave mm -hmm. RNA. But in both integrator and the normal cleavage and polydenylation machinery, one of the two subunits is catalytically active and the other, the active site is sort of degraded so that it still can bind to RNA, but it doesn't cleave RNA. So you have kind of an auxiliary subunit yeah. and the active subunit, and this arrangement is paralleled in the normal cleavage and polydenylation machinery and an integrator. And so that is the sort of a lot of the insights that we have into how integrator is cleaving really come from the, the, the vast literature on these beta-lactamase domains mm -hmm. and on the cleavage and polydenylation machinery. If I could wave a magic wand for you, what would you really like to know about integrator? <laughs> so what I would really like to know about integrator is, is very, very sort of specifically about its um, targeted recruitment to certain genes. What we found is that you can take a gene that has accessible chromatin, all the right histone modifications, transcription factor binding, brings in the polymerase, and yet if you bring an integrator, the gene is not on. The gene's expression is very, very low. Mm. So if you could imagine I guess, a situation, a disease context or a developmental mm. defect where one gene is, is aberrantly upregulated, if you could bring integrator selectively to that gene's promoter or find some key part of integrator to bring to, the, to that gene and turn it off in a way that, it, that doesn't need to supersede all of the you know, important things that the cell does to activate a gene, but just at that final step say, you know, no, we're going we're gonna to turn this gene off. I think that would be incredibly powerful, both as a, a therapeutic approach, but also as, to, as a basic biology sort of tool for understanding gene activity. What happens if you knock into great trout? It's lethal. It's lethal. Mm -hmm. And so we've been um, working a lot on really rapid degradation techniques in order to be able to investigate the effects of knocking out integrator really as soon after getting rid of it as possible. So we're, we're moving from RNA interference to degrons to be able to get rid of integrator within, you know, an hour of, uh, you know, sort of flipping mm -hmm. the switch. Because the, as I mentioned, integrator also um, is responsible for the cleavage of snRNAs. Mm -hmm. So if integrator uh, right, is not right, functional right, for too right. long, splicing goes awry, and then you end up having lots and lots of, of issues. And so we're really trying to, to find the most fast-acting strategies to, you know, in a targeted way, block integrator's mm -hmm. activity. And in particular, we're really interested in blocking the activity of the, the catalytic subunit and then replacing with mutants that it are either lacking the ability to interact with the other subunits mm -hmm. or lacking the ability to undergo this, this catalysis. Because when we rescue with a catalytic dead mutant, we find that the gene expression defects that we get, so start again. When you knock integrator down, there are a lot of defects. A lot right. of genes get turned on that shouldn't be on. You can rescue with wild type integrator, but if you try, went integrator 11, but if you try to rescue with the catalytic dead integrator 11 subunit, not only do those genes expression not get turned back down, but they actually are further uh, enhanced. So it's more of like a dominant negative than a rescue. And so that suggests that you can also form these kind of sub-complexes that co-opt parts of the machinery that presumably, if it's with a 14 subunit mm -hmm. complex, it does more than just cut the RNA. So we're trying to get into 
uh, fast acting strategies to pick apart what the other subunits do as well. Sounds as though you've got a lot to do. That we certainly do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Karen. Thank you, Jan.